Hey guys, welcome back to Keys to the Cosmos. This is video number 18 in my series, Ask Photography Target Tips. I hope you're able to catch my video, my last video on the Flaming Star Nebula. And the reason is because in this video, we're gonna be talking about its neighbor, IC410, the Tadpoles Nebula. So in that last video, I talked all about how to find the Flaming Star. And while we'll touch on that in this video, I definitely am not gonna repeat everything and get into depth to how to find it. So if you really are interested in that or you, um, IC410 is one you've perhaps never heard of or uh, would like to shoot but are wondering where exactly to find it, that video will provide everything you need to know in detail. This video we're going to move a little bit quicker, it should be a shorter one and we're going to focus more on of course how to process the target but also some of the new equipment that I use to capture it so look forward to that in this video. So let's talk a little bit about IC410, the Tadpoles Nebula first. So it's um, an emission nebula primarily, and it's very similar to Flaming Star. I'd say a little bit smaller, but I'd say equally as bright, maybe a touch, I don't know the magnitude off by hand, offhand, but here it is here. But it's a fairly bright target. Um, it's a decent size, so you should be able to shoot it with a variety of different telescopes, which we'll talk about shortly. And it's known be for its name because of the two tadpoles, sort of looking pieces of gas that are in it. So I'm gonna use the Stellarium version of this target and we'll save my image for the end since I've never shot this one before. So we'll use that as a reference. So let's talk about first of all how to find IC410. So very briefly as I mentioned I won't go into all the detail last time it's in the constellation Auriga. Auriga is a big um, constellation of stars in the eastern skies this time of year we're just about December 1st and it's known for its biggest star Capella. So that should be the easiest one to find that's in the top left corner but our focus will be on the right hand side. There's two stars, one above the other. And basically the Flaming Star and Tadpoles Nebula are just in between those stars and a little bit to the left. So we're moving in towards the center of Auriga. So just inside those two stars and about halfway is where you'll find these two beautiful targets. And so we talked about the Flaming Star, that's the higher one. The Tadpoles is right underneath it. So as I mentioned in my last video, you're bound to find one of them, unless you're way off to the left or to the right or way up or down. If you just point your telescope inside left and dead center, you're bound to find one of these. And then you can use an app like Stellarium and make adjustments. Either you gotta go up or down and slightly to the left or right, but you should be able to fairly easily find this with just even a star tracker and a laser pointer. So that's really good, easy to find and fairly bright so it should show up nicely in a 20 to 30 second test exposure. Let's talk about framing it up. Now if you're using something like a red cat you're going to have a lot of room so just um, I mean you, I think with a red cat you could almost get both of these we'll talk about that later but red cat it's going to appear quite small. My sharp star 76 millimeter is a great option as well but for this particular image, I used this telescope. Now I've never really shown it. It's been in, on the mount in some of those videos, but this is my Explore Scientific ED-102. And as you can see, it's in beautiful carbon fiber. So 102 millimeter, as opposed to my Sharp Star, which is 76 millimeter. So we have a little more focal length here. So if we're, if we're including the reducer on both of those scopes, the Sharp Star is 340 millimeters, give or take. This one is like 495, so a good amount, you know, 150 millimeters difference. So you're going to get a decent more amount of focal length with this particular scope. Without the focal reducer, I think it's 714, but I've only used it so far as a reducer. I don't like want the vignetting and the stars elongating. I almost always use a reducer. Uh, the only time I wouldn't maybe is if I'm chasing after small galaxies, but this really isn't the scope for that either. So I leave the reducer in. And it was just about perfect for this particular target. So if you're using the Sharp Star again, you're going to have a little bit of room. You'll definitely be cropping in. There is a lot of surrounding gas in this particular target. So it's up to you if you want to leave a more wide field and have all that surrounding gas. As always, I, I always say I will, but I end up cropping in. I just love the details of these targets. So I ended up cropping on this one as well. I did leave a little bit of room and you can see the surrounding gas. But with this particular telescope, I paired it with the uh, ZWO ASI. 294 MC Pro camera. So that's um, a camera we've talked about quite a few times uh, on this channel. It's the, my very first uh, dedicated astrophotography camera. It has a rectangular chip, 
So probably ideally I would have used the 533, but I had it on another scope and as usual I was being lazy. So I just left it on and I'm still happy with the results. It, it still did a nice job. And, um, you know, I did have to crop in a little bit, but no problems, nothing crazy. This really is probably the perfect scope for shooting one of these targets on its own. But as I mentioned, you can definitely get away with something like my Sharp Star or like a 60 millimeter telescope. And you could go as wide as the Red Cat, but I would really only do that if I was shooting both. So let's talk about um, integration time. So I got seven and a half hours on this particular target. And that was definitely more than enough. Um, I mean, I've seen much longer and they look beautiful. But I would say if you're under reasonable skies, you can get away with uh, three or four hours. But if you're in dark, um, more light polluted skies like myself, I would recommend anywhere from four to six hours. Should get you a really nice image. So. You should be able to do that on one long night if you get a nice clear patch of sky or over two nights. Now in this case, I did mine over three nights. It's just been horrible weather here in Toronto. Um, we're just basically taking what we can. So I just put together, you know, three nights, a couple hours, three hours a night and all together, I got seven and a half hours. So I was happy with that in the end. Um, and uh, I was very happy with this image in general. I'm not gonna say it's my best, but it was definitely my cleanest image, if that makes sense. Well, how do you quantify what that word means? We'll talk more about it more in processing, but it definitely that scope. And I should also mention too, that I did four minute exposures. Now, I know you're used to me saying 60 seconds unguided. Yes, this is my first full image doing four minute unguided exposure. So that taught, speaks to my mount. One you've seen in a couple of videos already. I'll definitely have a review on that very soon. But um, yeah, um, once I got it working and I've worked out most of the kinks, I'm still working on a few things. Um, it's delivering quite well. Four minute unguided exposures with, uh, even though this is not a what you'd call a huge scope, may look big here on the screen, but it's, you know, 102 millimeters. is That's middle of the road at, at best. So that's still considered a bit of a wide field telescope. So even with that, um, it was able to do four minute unguided exposures. And, you know, I can't lie. Listen, I always say, what, use whatever you have, even if it's just star tracker and a camera lens, that's great. But there is no doubt a difference. I can attest that when you start doing longer exposures, you get more detail. Um, you, you're not cropping as much. So it's not sort of artificial uh, magnification. It's pure. It's right there. And um, I'll show you here on my single exposure. So this is a single four minute exposure. So you can see very clearly the target. You can see the two tadpoles, which give it its name. So you see a difference. And when you have nice glass like this telescope has, um, I think it's, uh, we, I, I forget the name of it. It's here. I'll have all that in my review video. But um, when you put nice piece of nice glass on the front and you put a four minute exposure, you get, you definitely do get better results and it made it processing a lot easier as well. So I'm excited about that. I'm still going to be doing my star tracker. So I'll, I'm, I'm still, I'm actually working on a target right now using my star tracker. So I'm hoping the idea is to have both of them out at night, most nights. So I'll definitely have videos with both. So for you, those, you guys using star trackers, it's not like I'm leaving you behind. Um, but it is good to know what you can expect once you do make that choice to buy a mount and, and the difference that you'll see. So yeah, seven and a half hours, very happy with that. I use my L Extreme filter as, uh, as usual, and along with the other equipment, uh, the 294 camera. Uh, that definitely was more than enough exposure time or integration time to produce what I considered uh, a, a nice image that I was happy with in the end. So let's talk about processing. Now, as I mentioned with the four minute exposures and a little bit more focal length, it definitely made it a little bit easier this was not one that I had to do, you know, five, six times starting over again, like some of those targets out there. It's fairly bright and all that. So it pops pretty easy. You don't have to do a ton of stretching. I didn't find you have some choices to make. Now, there is there's a lot of detail in the in the target itself, but there's also some surrounding gas. So you'll see if you look at Instagram or Astrobent and all that, you'll see different sort of versions of the IC410. Some are more zoomed in, some are more wide field and they get all the gas around it. I tried to do something sort of in the middle. I did catch some of that uh, HA gas around it, but I did do somewhat of a significant crop. What can I say? I just always end up doing a crop. I love to see the details in these beautiful targets. So once again, I end up doing more of a cropped image. 
Um, but let's talk about processing specifically. There's really not nothing out of the ordinary. I'll just give a few tips. So obviously, um, I do the usual where I lassoed off the entire thing, just sort of worked on camera raw filter to pull the target itself out. I left that outside gas, but when I selected inverse, okay, to work on the background, I didn't go too crazy darkening it. Okay. I didn't want to make that gas disappear. So I wanted to show up. I just didn't want to be sort of the focal feature of the image. So I made sure that I left that still very visible. When I'm working on the background, you know, I just slightly lower exposure, lower the black point, um, luminance, bring the luminance up just to sort of smooth it out to give you a nice smooth background and, the, and get the nebula itself to pop off the back. So once that was done um, and made a few more adjustments to the nebula itself, so again, selecting inverse, now we're working back on the target. Then I selected off of that and I just started to pick out key features. I would say I'll use my uh, Stel uh, Stellarium version of it just as an example. I'll save my picture for the end. So the tadpoles themselves, the two pieces of, I guess, dust or gas there that make that give it its name, that sort of look like little tadpoles, those I lassoed off together. So I lassoed off the one, then if you hold down shift on Photoshop, you can lasso off another uh, tar target or section and you can hold down shift and do as many as you want. But in this case, I did those two. And again, camera raw filter, texture tab, clarity, just to sort of really make them sharp and, and have them pop off the background. After I did that, I just really focused on some of the areas where I felt like I could bring out the gas, um, where it had a lot of texture to it, just to sort of enhance that texture. I talk about it all the time. It's, it's all about, for me, making your images have depth. And the best way to do that is variety. You want some areas a little bit softer, some a little bit darker, some a little bit brighter, some a little bit more textured. And when you have that variance and you do it in a way that it sort of all blends together, that's what gives you depth. That and, of course, a nice, smooth, dark background to make it pop. So that's what I try to do. So there's some areas of gas. I'll show you on Solarium here, up above and to the right of the tadpoles. I just sort of um, lassoed off some of those areas, sort of same thing, whites, clarity, texture, make them pop out. And then there, you'll notice there's some dark patches of sort of dark gas and dust. Those I sort of made pop out, lower the black points, um, and what else, you know, fool around with camera off. There's a lot of little sliders there that can make that pop out. And that really added to what I called before a very clean image where um, everything just sort of blended in even though all the adjustments i made they all look like natural and it was very crisp and clean and um yeah not a lot of like graininess anywhere so i was really happy with that i was very happy with the equipment finally to have it working and to see the results of it so it definitely does make a difference but this is a fairly easy target even if you're doing 60 second exposures with a with a dslr you know, you may need to sink a little bit more time and a little bit more time in processing, but you can still get a really nice result. So don't let that hold you back. But other than that, that's basically it. Oh, there's one thing I, I do want to mention as well. You'll notice in my final image, there's a little bit of a blue tinge to it. Now, um, I did that on purpose. I wanted to just to give it a bit of variety. You know me, I hate just red. I try to make my images more of a sort of pinkish red. Um, that's just my personal opinion. So I wanted to give a try and fake, as it were, a little bit of um, color variety. So what I did was, I've talked about this before. I I, I uh, lassoed off certain part of the image, maybe of the image, certain parts of it, I should say. And if you go in, in Photoshop to, um, I can't remember. It's the, well, it's the adjustments tab. So basically, the same the same menu where you're doing your curves and levels adjustments. Um, there is a tab called adjustments and then if you go to that there's a whole menu that pops down and one of them is the exposure tab so if you click on that exposure tab there's something called uh, there's three sliders that open up and the bottom one's called gamma correction so if you just take and very carefully use this okay because it, it can it can be very obvious if you're not careful I just slide that slider to the left just slightly and it starts to give it sort of a lighter blue tinge. And that's what I did. So yeah, hopefully you notice that in the in my final image. I just did that to give it some variance and I, I like the effect that it made. And of course, all these adjustments that we're doing, make sure that you feather. We talk about this in every video. Make sure you feather at least 15, 20 pixels. That way, when you make these adjustments, you don't get a hard line and it's not super obvious that you made those adjustments. Other than that though, guys, it's fairly easy. Play around with it, see what you can do. 
Um, sink as much time as you can though. Try to get at least six, seven hours. And I think you're gonna be really happy with the target like this, even if you're fairly new to the hobby. So hopefully that helps. So I'm gonna have more videos to come. Definitely gonna be having a review on this telescope. I look forward to sharing that with you. Definitely a beautiful scope. Really happy with it. And of course, I'll have a video on my mount very soon. Just trying to sink as much time as I can into it so that I can give you an educated video and provide everything you need to know about it. Good and bad, of course, and who that uh, amount like that is, is good for. So look for that very soon. But in, in the meantime, guys, thanks so much. I really appreciate your support. Please subscribe if you haven't already. You'll have a lot more coming your way. But for now, here's my image of IC410, the Tadpoke Nebula. Thanks so much. Thank you.